Hi, and welcome to a Victorious Life, an outreach teaching ministry of the Shallow Holiness Church located at 2419 North Glass Street in the beautiful city of Roses, Tyler, Texas. I'm your host, Lori Stimson Ortega, and as always, we want to say thank you for allowing us to come into your uh, homes. We are in our 10th year of television ministry, and we are just as excited today as we were uh, the first time we taped. Now, I do have some exciting news that we're going to share with you uh, more than likely next uh, month after all the plans have been finalized. So let's, let's, let's go into the word on that note and talk about uh, Moses stuttering and all that to break the silence. Okay, we, we are now in chapter five and it says, now Moses and Aaron have now come down to the, they're, they're in Egypt and they have gone to uh, the elders. OK, now Charlton Heston and the movie, The Ten Commandments, would have you think that they automatically went directly into Pharaoh and said, let them go. They didn't do that. They went to the elders first to get buy in, spiritual buy in and support of the people. And, and that's something we have to realize. God is not running around here endorsing chaos. You know, he he's not he's not orchestrating confusion. So when they went into um, when they went went into Pharaoh leading into chapter five or coming into chapter five, they already had the support of the people. They didn't want to go. God didn't want them to go into Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh what they're going to do. And then the people be like, who are you now? You're going to do what? <laughs> Let me get this straight. You are here to to set us free. So there was a, a protocol to follow. So verse number five says, and afterward, uh, chapter five, verse number one, excuse me, says, and afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus said the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Now, again, you can't trust Hollywood, right? You, you can't trust the movies because they didn't go in there again uh, for all of you that are relying on the movies to give you your biblical interpretation, this is the part that they didn't put in there. They went, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh first and they said, let us take them into the wilderness for a feast. Now, the reason they wanted to go into the wilderness for a feast, it is served a dual purpose. Number one, the movement of those people, you know, that, that, that was a lot of people to move into the wilderness at one time for three days. So it was to gauge under, you know, in unspoken language, it would gauge how it would help Moses to see the magnitude of how many people he would end up bringing out. OK, now it wasn't going to happen because remember, God said he would harden Pharaoh's heart. The next thing that that uh, the reason he wanted to wanted them to go into the wilderness for a feast for three days is because prior to the to them going into prior to the Passover, they had not been uh, uh offering sacrifices and things of that nature to the Lord. So they were out of spiritual compliance. Nine times out of 10, some of them may not have been circumcising their sons because they had become too acclimated or, or, or too, too uh, closely uh, uh, comfortable and, 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 and used to, and have had incorporated some of the Egyptian practices into their way of living as well as their religious uh, uh, practices. So when he said, Hey, let them go into the wilderness for three days, that was so they could be purified and they could start the process of getting back to their, their prior way of living prior to them uh, being placed in, in, uh, in, in Egypt you know, or, or in slavery. And, and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now this, when I read this, I thought it was very interesting that Moses asked the, asked God the question, who am I? Meaning who am I as an individual? But look what Pharaoh says, who is the Lord? 
<laughs> okay? You talk about some confidence. Pharaoh wasn't worried about who he is, who, who am I as Pharaoh? He was like, who is the Lord? You know, again, look, look at that. Look, look at the, look at the, the confidence level. Moses, who am I that I should go? Pharaoh, who is the Lord? So you knew that Pharaoh had a high level of confidence, even to the point of arrogance. And, and I do want to say this because I remember having a conversation with somebody. I believe it was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Thursday or Friday, excuse me, about, uh, about uh, the difference between confidence and arrogance. You know, some people will try to say, I'm not, I'm not arrogant. People are mistaking my arrogance for confidence. That's not true. We know arrogance, right, Mr. Cameraman? We, we can, people are not as, as, as inept and slow as other people think they are. We, we, we can tell when you're operating in arrogance. Uh, as opposed to confidence, people who operate in confidence, uh, are people who, who are still humbleness of spirit and humbleness of mind. People, people who operate in confidence, they don't feel threatened by anybody, anybody that people on the flip side, people that operate in, in arrogance, they feel threatened. You can't tell them anything. They know all the answers. They have all of the advice. They don't want to hear sign or sound uh, counsel or anything of that nature. So there is a difference. In this case, Pharaoh was operating in from the standpoint of arrogance, because when he says, who is the Lord? Remember, people have been giving him credit as being uh, a divinity. So uh, if, if not a divinity himself, the offspring of a, 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 a divinity. So he's saying who, first of all, who is the Lord? And, and, and since I don't know him, why do I have to obey him? You know? And, and he says, you know what? He told him straight up. He said, I don't know the Lord. So no, I'm not going to let Israel go. Now, can you imagine that you're going in there and you're the God, God has told you, Hey, I'm going to, he's going to, he's going to let him go and you're going to take them out. I'm going to bring them out. And then you hear no, but remember in chapter four and parts of chapter three, he had already given him a heads up for this. So he had prepared Moses for a negative response. Okay. Then we get to verse number three. It says, and they said, the God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go. We pray thee three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord, our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. So they say to Pharaoh, okay, but the God of the Hebrews notice they didn't say our God. He said, or they said, the God of the Hebrews, he met with us. So they were saying to Pharaoh again, we're begging you. And it says, we pray thee, we, we adjure thee, we pray thee, we, we are asking of you, we begging you three days journey so that we can go and sacrifice. And that's really what it was about. You know, it, it was about them instituting those old practices that God wanted them to, 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 uh, uh, continue to, to institute. Okay. Now I want to say this, that I forgot to say about, uh, uh, circumcision from last week's lesson, you know, uh, I, cause somebody sent me, a a call and asked a question about this. And they asked the question, uh, in 2016, uh, do, do, can, if, 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 a, if a male believer is not circumcised, can he go to heaven? And I'm here to tell you, yes, he can go to heaven uh, if he's not circumcised because baptism is circumcision for all of us. Okay. Being baptized in, in Jesus, you know, in baptized in Jesus name in the new Testament or baptism itself that's our, that's our form in the new Testament. Again, as modern day believers, that is, that is how we, you know, the, 
the, the aligning ourselves with salvation through Jesus Christ. So there are, there are people who are running around here saying 10 to people who are new converts that are 50, 40 and some years old. You got it. You can't get to heaven. Stop telling people that. Okay. You, you, you got to, you, you, you got to get to heaven now by accepting Christ into your life. You got to be saved. Okay. You're not going to just stumble into heaven. You're not going to uh, accidentally fall into heaven. That's not going to happen. So when, when I wanted to, to bring that point up because when they, they had not that evidently that was a practice that they had, some of them had not been being faithful to. And also uh, they had not been sacrificing as unto the Lord and as the Lord required them because they were in, uh, they were in bondage, they were enslaved and they did not have the freedom and the liberty to do that. It, it's also asking for the three days journey was so that they all could be spiritually uh, in line with, with, uh, well, we'll just say on one accord so that they could be, so, so that God could, they could offer sacrifice sacrifices. And then God could, it could be acceptable thereby purifying and cleaning the entire congregation. Now we know that he didn't let them out to go, uh, to go and, and do that. We, we, we know that, you know, uh, but what we do know is before he let them out, the Passover. And when he saw the blood, so that was the blood of the pat, the blood on the lentils and the doorposts, as the KJV Bible says, that was really their purification and the cleansing process because they were on the inside of the house and the blood was on the outside. So when God saw the blood, he passed over, meaning he had grace and he had mercy. So we did want to uh, clarify some things and expound upon some things. You know, we didn't want to uh, we're not here to argue uh, with anyone, but we, we did want to make that, that point clear that we forgot to say on last week that when we accept Christ as our savior and, and we, you know, we, we were saved, we receive the spirit and we're baptized. That is the washing away or the cutting away of that old life and the identity of the new life. So that's really what the, the circum, the, uh, the, the act of circumcision itself. That's why God instituted that. Like we said on last week, it was instituted so that people would come to associate his people with him in that one little, uh, one little, uh, uh, act or what have you. So now we go back to Exodus chapter five, verse three. And they said, the God of the Hebrews had met with us. Okay. We, and, and they wanted to go. So we're, we're not going to read that again where he's, you know, we just went over that by sacrifices. Verse number four, it says, and the king of Egypt said unto them. Now he's gone from the Pharaoh and Pharaoh said to now the king of Egypt and the king of Egypt said unto them, wherefore do ye Moses and Aaron let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? Verse five, and Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land now are many and ye make them rest from their burdens. He's like, okay, number one, they got that kind of time that they can just leave work to go on a three day weekend. They can go on holiday. They're not busy enough. You know, he's like, wait a minute. So you're telling me that they don't have enough work that, that they, their workload is such that they can factor in uh, uh, three extra days not to do anything. So look at what verse number six does. Pharaoh flips the script on him and he commands the same day, the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, verse seven, ye shall no more give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves and the tally or tell of the bricks, which they did make heretofore, ye shall lay upon them you shall not diminish aught thereof, for they be idle. Therefore, that cry, they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our Lord. So from verses 6 all the way down to verse number 10, Pharaoh changes the dynamics of their work environment and their working condition. Whereas before, uh, they had people who were basically bringing straw to help them make bricks. Now 
they're not going to have that luxury. Now, this is something that I think is, is interesting when you look at building construction in the ancient world. And what's so funny about it, Mr. Cameron, prior to me ever teaching a Bible study, I used to read a lot of books about what I thought was frivolous stuff of that nature. Now it all makes sense so that I would be able to recall it. Now, there were two types of bricks that were that were used or made in the ancient world uh, on the different continents. Now, there were bricks in Egypt, the pier, the bricks that the, that, that are, that, uh, were made or used in the construction of the pyramids. Those bricks incidentally don't have straw. They're basically, they were baked, uh, in the sun. So what the straw was really doing was it was providing them. It was the, 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 the clay, was adhering to the straw so the brick would dry faster as it was being, you know, once it was formed, it would dry faster so they could, you know, could continue to build. But it wasn't very as reliable uh, because you know, you had to, if, if, if you could have air pockets and air bubbles and all of those things in it. And, 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 but the brick that when he told them, Hey, get rid of the straw, that was really a stronger brick because it was more like concrete or, or cement. Cause it was being again, baked in the sun. Now, incidentally, you notice the pyramids have survived, but you don't see any, uh, Egyptian homes that have survived. You've never seen where the Egypt, Egyptian villages or what have you, you've never seen that. So you understand that the construction projects that the Pharaohs and the Romans, two different time periods. Okay. We don't, we're not going to give glory to one and diminish the reputation by diminishing the reputation of another one. But they were, they were uh, uh, very adamant about their building campaigns. So one of the things that they really, that, that has survived the test of time was either their quarried rock or their, the, the way they made bricks. So what Pharaoh was doing was he was changing the dynamics of their working environment by, by saying, Hey, you got that much time on your hand. You can get your own straw. So as a result, quite possibly in history, it, it, it led into a stronger building material because of that one decision. Now, you know, you can't prove that, but it is, it is uh, odd that none of the Egyptian, the only Egyptian structures are, that are, are pretty much standing are those pyramids and a lot of their different uh, artifacts by way of sculptures and, and those things of that nature. But for everyday life, they're not excavating into folks' homes. Uh, so, so I just wanted to, and I just felt like saying that because I like history, Mr. Cameron. So it made sense in my mind. The rationale was there. So he tells them, you know, hey, take their brick away or take their straw away. And when he takes their straw away, look at what happens in uh, verse number 12. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. So they had become to a certain extent enabled. Okay. And if we're not careful as modern day believers, we will allow ourselves to be, to become enabled. Okay. We will, we uh, are, our people will enable us to, to, and allow for us not to be on top of our game when we need to be on top of our game. An example of that is when we're talking about enabling, you know, if, uh, you know, if, if you go to the hospital and they send you to a rehab program, you know, for, for like an injury or anything of that nature, and you work your way through rehab and you're doing good. And then you go home and they have a person who comes, uh, to, to, uh, maybe clean your house and pick up for pick up little things like home health. And I'm not here to speak against, uh, 
home health agency, uh, Pastor uh, Williams, Patri Sister Patricia Williams or Pastor Williams, they own a wonderful home health uh, agency uh, off of uh, Duncan Street. So, you know, if you need home health, by all means, give them a call. Very rep reputable agency. But if you need it, you know, we'll say home health and you had an injury. So you came home and your injury was such that you needed to work on your own pace and maybe a therapist came out. I've known people, Mr. Cameraman, that they didn't want to do that because they didn't, they didn't want to work or, or do the rehabilitation side on their own. And what ended up happening, they became enabled by their families and, and those that cared about them and they ended up in a much worse situation than before because they had been enabled to basically do nothing. They, they came to uh, rely on the home health people coming out, picking up, cleaning up, running errands, not realizing this is not going to, to last, but maybe a month or two weeks to six weeks or however long. So when the person left, they had become totally dependent on that individual because other people had basically enabled them not to do anything, you know, and, and that's what you see here that the, that the Israelites had become dependent upon heavily dependent upon the Egyptians. So that when, when, when God hardened Pharaoh's heart to where he said, take the straw away, God was really starting the process of getting them to be more industrious and independent on their own. He didn't want them depending on anybody. And that's something that we have to think about if we are going to apply this to our modern day lives and to our walk with Christ. You know, the Lord, he wants us to reach and become independent. You know, he doesn't want us to constantly uh, rely on, on the kindness of strangers. As the movie says, uh, you know, he, he goes, he, he, he wants us to, to, he, he creates situations where we can't look to anybody for help or assistance. He, he creates situations where, you know, when our backs are against the wall, instead of us asking for this person's advice or this person's opinions, he creates a situation where we go to him, where he wants us to go to him and confide in him and trust him and ask him and, and make things uh, known, make the things known that we need to him. So that's what happened. They, they, had, they had reached a point where they'd become dependent. So he began to, God, God used that situation to start working them more towards or gaining working them towards gaining more independence and verse number 13 and the taskmaster hasted hasted them saying fulfill your works your daily task as when there was straw so they're like look the taskmasters or the bosses are saying you still got to do the same amount of work don't get it twisted you're still going to do the same amount and and if you don't they're going to be problems and repercussions because they were not going to run the risk those taskmasters were not going to run the risk of being uh, sh shown or dis displayed uh, or portrayed, excuse me, in a negative light in, in front of Pharaoh. Verse 14, and the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, wherefore have ye not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today as heretofore? Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? Now, look at this. When they didn't make the tally of bricks, okay, then the supervisors, the, the Israelite supervisors, basically got beaten. Okay, they were reprimanded by way of a physical beating. Now, look at what they did. They went after their beating they went to Pharaoh, all right? And they said to Pharaoh, they asked Pharaoh, why are you doing, why are you treating us like this? Why are you doing this to us? Which I thought the irony in that was just too great. 
Because look at what they said. There is no straw given unto thy servants. Look, look at how it's kind of like that, like the saying goes, you, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Or you can put, uh, and I hate to say the hood cause I, I live in, I, I happen to think hood is just your neighborhood, you know, and sometimes the way we say hood, it gives, it sends a negative connotation about where we live. So when I say hood, and I had to clarify that today in the prison and last week in com passing conversation, when I say hood, that means I live in my neighborhood, but it also means that I live in a predominantly African-American area. Doesn't mean that it's shooting everywhere and that people are, you know, can't walk down the street without getting harassed or accosted. That's not my neighborhood. Okay. So when I use the lovingly use the phrase hood, it's, I, I don't want to give the impression that it's in, I live in a bad neighborhood because I do not. That's, that's, that's just another way, like with Ebonics, that's our, so that's our way of lovingly showing affection for our neighborhood. But on the flip side to that, some, when I go to the city, we'll say er, seriously urban areas, and when there are more progressive uh, neighborhoods that are based on ethnicity, and there's still a lower socioeconomic er, uh, area that that is populated by, we'll say ghetto, I don't say hood, I say ghetto, because ghetto is a state of mind. And, and, and you can tell there's a big difference. Hear me out, people, in the 903 area code, Mr. Cameron. Big difference between hood and ghetto. Two totally differences to me, two big differences. So in this, you saying all that to say this and using that example, to reinforce, you can take, God was trying to put them in a position where they were basically using that example, they were living in a gated community, but they went before Pharaoh with the ghetto mentality. We're saying they went with a slave mentality by saying, hey, why are you dealing with your slaves or your servants like this? You know, uh, uh, there's no straw for your servants. Huh? You know who they didn't go talk to before they went and talked to him? Moses. Go talk to Moses first. After you got beat, you should have went and talked to Moses first and said, Moses, look, help me understand that God is going to do what for us? Because when you went, when they went to Pharaoh, it sent a missed message. It sent the impression that they really didn't want to be free. That Moses was just up there just creating this, you know, that Moses was just, just, he, he didn't, he, they didn't want what he wanted. Because remember, Pharaoh wasn't privy to the conversation that Moses and Aaron had had with the elders. And you remember, we read it on last week that the people in chapter four, verse 31, they believed. And what did they do? They gave God praise and they worshiped him. But now they're in front of the king, Pharaoh, saying, you know what? Hold on. Wait a minute. We your people. No, hold on. No, it, it, it's not like that because they kept saying thy servants. Now, look at what they talk about. So they talk about, but they, 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 they talk about thy servants are beaten. No, you're not. First of all, you're not Pharaoh's people. Okay. You are God's people but you're just in a negative situation. That's why the Bible says, obey them that have rule over you. And, and, and I do not believe that people in religious leadership should be, should, should govern and control every aspect of a person's uh, natural life. You know, that's, that's not, and if we're not careful in 2016, we'll take a whole lot of these scriptures out of context. When it says, uh, when the scripture says, uh, you know, obey them that have rule over thee. First of all, that's talking about, uh, you know, let, let us, let us respect our governing bodies. Let us respect our leaders. You know, uh, I, president Obama, notice I preface that 
by saying President Obama. I have, I, I'm going to say it now, but I don't talk, I don't say Obama. That is the president of the United States. I doubt if you go over to England, they're going to say Elizabeth. They're going to say Queen Mother or Queen Elizabeth or the Queen. So when we are to respect our leaders, you know, meaning our governing and ruling leaders. We are to respect those that have authority. You know, we are to respect law enforcement. You know, I'm not here to say they don't make bad choices, but you know what, as, as, as the spouse of a person who's in law enforcement, you really have to understand the magnitude of what they are required to do. Their, their primary goal is to protect and serve. What, what people don't realize is a lot of uh, law enforcement officers, they make their money by working side jobs, by patrolling at the mall, at the zoo, at games. They're making extra money because teachers and policemen, they're not paid a whole lot. You know, now we have some who are, you know, we're not even going to get into that. But so, so you have to understand those people have the same issues and problems just like everybody else. And if they don't have Christ in their lives, yes, they will fall victim to beating anybody, regardless of the color of somebody's skin. They, they will fall victim and susceptible to their emotions. It's a highly charged, you know, sit, highly charged situations often solicit highly charged emotions and reactions. Now I'm not condoning uh, the degradation of any human being, regardless of their color. I'm, I'm not, I'm not condoning police brutality or what have you, but it's no different in my mind than looking on Facebook or YouTube and folk are passing fight videos you know, of little kids, of girls and uncles and aunties. Violence is violence. And we do not condone violence in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But my point is that when, when, you, when, you look, when you look at the situation, what they were really saying was instead of them going to Moses and, and asking him, they, they were over there in, in the presence of the person that would try to kill them. That they really didn't care anything uh, about them. I don't know how I got off on pr police brutality, Mr. Cameron, but other than that. But anyway, but they were talking to him, whereas they had just said, you know, that that we're going to we're going to believe like in verse number 31. Hey, they praise God. They worship God. Oh, now I remember how I got onto it. When we said obey them that have rule over you, we should respect the law. Okay. Laws are there for a reason. So we should respect the law. We should never be in, uh, uh, in de de defiance of the law. You know, we should, we should always again, try to live above board, but, but what we do not need to do. And I know Mr. Cameron, they're going to call me for this. Uh, you know, your pastor is not your father. Your pastor is not your mother. Your leaders are not to be, you know, they, they, they should not take precedence over how you live your whole life. That's wrong. God's not in that. You know, I, I hear a lot of people say, that's my, that's my son or my daughter in, in the gospel. Okay. You know, or that's my father in the gospel. I, this just me. I had one father and he was an amazing man in my eyes. And I dare not call anybody else father, okay? Because Jesus said, call no man father. But I dare not disrespect his memory. Now, I'm not here to say that it's wrong. I'm just here to say for me, if we're not careful as, as leaders, we will have people giving us all this unwarranted and unnecessary uh, uh, pump and circumstance when it's like, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that you, you respect your, your pastors and the lead church leadership more than you respect your family? You mean to tell me your, your pastor or, your, or his wife can call and tell you, I need such and such, and you drop everything? But if your own mother or father call you, well, I'll be over there tomorrow. Something is wrong with that. God ordained for family units and there has to be a balance. So again, I'm not here to tell you 
you know, how to treat your pastor or your, or your pastor's wife. I'm, I think we should treat everybody the way we want to be treated. And I, I and, and I do think that if we're not careful, we're living in a society and a time where all of this unnecessary rec- honor and recognition is getting way out of control. Because I guarantee you that when the pastors and and all the religious leaders, when they show up for jury duty, they're being called by their first names. OK, when they when they are called for their civic responsibilities, they is just like they're any other person. Now, I'm not here to tell you to to just dis, you know, just toss them to the wind. There is an honor in any man or woman being a carrier of the word of God in them being a minister and, and to be elevated to the office of pastor. I'm not I'm not speaking against that. What I'm saying is in, by using this as an example God wanted to take those people to another level. He wanted to to get that slave mentality out of them. And what were they doing? They were trying to get right back into it because I feel led to say this. Every every ethnic group on the face of the earth has been enslaved in some way, shape, form or fashion during one one or more time periods throughout the history of the world. But uh, uh, in in particular, one ethnic group in particular, please read between the lines. If we're not careful, we're going to still have that plantation mentality. We're just going to shift it into a church, you know? So, cause, cause we, we, we off the, we off the plantation. Okay. We're not slaves anymore. And if we're not careful, we're going to end up like the Romans. We're, We're paying tribute. We are, we are honoring, we're, we're treating people like they're plantation owners and, and we just bring in the harvest and we're not reaping anything from it, but we just dance in a jig and we're singing and clapping and all those things. And so that's what that verse means. And, and you know what? I, I hate, I got off on this, but it needs to be said. So that's what, that's what he was saying. Obey them that have rule over you, but, but, but don't, don't get all this, you know, let's, let's get back to the focus where God is our focus, where, where Christ living the best life that we can live in him is, is our focus listening and reckoning to, and, 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 uh, uh, listening and reverencing and, and recognizing his voice as opposed to, you know, it was prophesied to me. Spirit of the Lord told this person this. You know what? I'm not even going to pretend, Mr. Cameron, if I pastor, if I were a pastor of a church, if I pastored a church and you was a member and I knew you was giving four or five hundred dollars every week. Spirit of the Lord, if, if I'm not where I need to be, the spirit of the Lord is going to tell me a whole lot of stuff about you. Spirit of the Lord said he going to bless you. Spirit of the Lord said you need you right where you need to be. You know, so I'm saying let's let's just I better press. I better I better pr- put a period at the end of that because I keep comma and comma. So let's just get back to this. Y'all, y'all my numbers at the bottom of the screen. Feel free. <laughs> Leave it on voicemail. <laughs> but you know me, I call. How you doing? I had a question. You had a question about something. Anyway, so he says that to them. And then look at what happens in verse number 19. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case. That means they were in a bad situation. After it was said, ye shall not diminish or diminish. That means lower uh, from your bricks of your daily task. Why did they think going behind Moses back talking to uh, the taskmasters and Pharaoh about his treatment of them. Why did they think that was going to end well for them? They were out of order. And, and and when we say they were out of, by that, I mean, uh, it was an indication that they didn't understand the magnitude of what was going on. Now I understand if you were a supervisor, which was a officer, if you were a supervisor, you could say, Hey, I don't understand. Why we got to be beating on everybody? Help me understand why are we getting beat now? What what did we do? But by that same token, you know what God was teaching them? God was teaching them total dependence on him. And he was teaching them that Moses is the designated leader. All right? Is a designated leader. And and he was teaching them to, you know, 
stop just agreeing to stuff without having a good understanding. You know, wasn't the, was, doesn't the Bible say in all that getting, get an understanding. Okay. So they get upset because really when he went to, when they went to go talk to him, it didn't change anything. He said what he was going to say. So why did they think that going in there and placing themselves in a role of a subservient role that it would, it would change his mind that, that no, God was going to get them out of there. He didn't want them to be uh, his servants, which, which we can apply that to our modern day walk. Why do we think that when we compromise the word of God and, and we compromise his words and, and, and usher in compromise within our lives, why do we think it's going to end well for us? You know what? That's not fool's logic. When you compromise your, your value system and your morals and your ethics and your religious convictions, why do you think you're going to be able to just be blissfully happy and, and everything's going to fall together like the yellow brick road? It, it, it's not. There's going to be struggle. There's going to be adversity. There's going to be a lot of unnecessary uh, setbacks. Why? Because you are compromising the integrity of the word. You're, you're, you're not applying when you don't apply it to your life. When you compromise and you turn the word into a buffet by saying, I want this, but now I don't want that. It's like going through lubies. You get, you can start out with a salad. You can get a meat entree, some sides and bread. And then if you want to a dessert, it's like saying, no, I don't want any salad. Yeah, I want that. Uh, give me that T-bone steak. No, I don't want any sides. Uh, yeah, I'll take some, I'll take a roll. And I'll take some dessert and I'll take a large extra sweet, sweet tea, almost to a taste in like a uh, snow cone syrup. Why do you think you're, you're, you're going to be healthy? <laughs> you know, why do you think you're, you're going to be super fine and super, you know, b uh, beef is it, do I say buffed? Why, why do you, uh, you know, why, why do you think you're going to, it's not going to happen. You know why? Cause you're opting out of the things that are good for you. So like them, why do we do that? Why do we think we can compromise in our walk with Christ? Why do we think, well, you know what? He's going to bless me because I'm going to church and I'm sitting on a pew every Sunday and I'm singing and I'm clapping and I'm dropping 10 or $20 in, in the offering bucket. You know, I'm paying my tithes, but you're not living a committed lifestyle. He's honoring you're the paying of your tithes by letting you keep your job. Okay. He's, he's helping you to do that. But if you don't live a committed lifestyle, you know, you're compromising really what the preachers and teachers, what he's giving to you to help you be better. And you'll never be as successful as he wants and has will for you to be. So they say that to him and then look at what they do now. And they met Moses in verse 20 and Aaron and stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. So Moses and Aaron is basically standing out there saying, okay, now we just left them last, the day before yes, We just left Pharaoh. Why were y'all in? See, I couldn't be Moses or Pharaoh because I would be standing there thinking, what? Where y'all coming from? You know, where y'all coming from? And they meet Moses and Aaron as they were coming from Pharaoh. And look what they said. Verse 21, the Lord look upon you, meaning God is going to get you uh, and judge. Okay. So now he's going to get Moses and Aaron for going in there saying exactly what he told them to say, but he's not going to get you for being out of order going in there and doing the opposite of what you have been instructed to do. It says, because you, you, you have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. He was, they were basically saying we were in good graces with Pharaoh. Long as we stayed in our place and we stayed in our lanes, we were fine. 
He liked us. Everybody liked us. But now you came along and you started working on stuff. You started speaking up for us when nobody told you to speak for us. And now we're in a bad situation. Not you in a bad situation. We're in a bad situation. And look what Moses did in verses 22 and 23. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he had done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. You know what I like about Moses? And you can already tell that Moses is learning. He doesn't know, oh, any of them an explanation. He takes what he, he takes his frustration. He takes his anger. He takes his confusion. He takes his doubt, his discouragement. He takes it to the Lord. And he has a conversation with the Lord, thereby Moses taking all of this frustration, anger, confusion, doubt, misunderstanding in prayer. That's what he does. He doesn't stand there and say, well, I'm, I know. Remember, I told y'all God told me to do. It. Remember, I showed y'all the rod to turn to a snake and the leprous hand and and all that. He didn't say that in between verses 21 and 22 is a long spiritual time. I don't mean numerically, but it is a spiritual transition. You see how Moses, instead of responding to them, instead of tossing his hands to the wind, he goes to God. And that's where we want to leave you on today. During your times of frustration, anger, confusion, disappointment, setbacks, even on the flip side to that, your triumphs, your successes, your accomplishments and all of those things before you start going and running to other people. Why not humble yourself and take all of that to the Lord in prayer? And we see in, in, in Exodus chapter five that Moses is becoming a different man from Exodus chapter three. He slowly evolving into God, into who God would have for him to be. He's learning the attributes of leadership because a leader that does not pray a leader that if, if everything goes right uh, uh, for, lead, for leaders. And, and, and I want to, let me clarify what I was about to say. Leaders that it, it comes with a, a higher level of responsibility. And, and good leaders make sure that they look at all sides of it. They make good decisions, sound decisions. They make sound judgments. And when they do that, a, a good leader, the quality for leadership is knowing when, as, as, Kenny, as Kenny Rogers would say, when to hold and when to fold. But, but look at what God is doing. God is teaching Moses. And you see that he's learning how to become the leader and the man that God would have for him to be. Well, we're all out of time. As we always say, if you have Christ, you're already a winner. If you have the spirit of the living God, you can face any challenge life throws your way. You can live a victorious life. God bless you. So God spoke to Jeremiah one day and he said, go down to the potter's house and I'm going to talk to you there. So, how old are you? I am 13. 15 years old. I went to a very charismatic church, you know, the kind where you lift up your hands and you worship the Lord and you sing Jehovah Jireh 77 times in a row. <laughs> that was Carrie Crocker. We're so glad you came. Well, we're going to go see you. We'll be right back to visit with you. And tell you a little bit more about us. Yes.
remember that. Create a way. 